this is the last topic that we're going to see in this unit on thermodynamics. It's called heat engines and it's a good way to close because heat engines is basically taking all the information we've learned and applying it to something useful. Um, so heat engines are basically machines that use thermal energy or heat energy to produce some useful amount of work, um, which is mechanical energy. So that would be the definition of a heat engine. So a heat engine is a machine that converts um, converts thermal energy to mechanical energy or work. And many scientists wanted to see if this was possible because there are many simple sources of heat energy such as burning coal or yes, yeah, starting a fire and being able to use this heat for work to do a work would be very useful and turns out that it is very useful and now it is very common. So the first heat engine that was invented was the steam engine. Um, that's what made loco locomotives move, um, the first mass transportation. So some examples of these heat engines are the um, steam engine. Um, there is also the steam turbine in which water is heated up. It generates vapor, water vapor, and the vapor is used to move a turbine around and generate electricity. And this is actually how we get most of our electricity at home, from a giant steam turbine that is moved when water is heated up and the vapor moves the turbine. And we also have internal combustion engines. Internal combustion engines which are the engines inside of our cars, the engines that use gasoline and burn up gasoline in order to generate um, enough power to actually move a car. So these are all examples of heat engines that we use um, every day, basically. So how does it work? The idea is that we have an engine here. So this is going to be the engine that produces work. Right? So from here, we want to get some work. But in order to do that, we need to put into the engine some um, heat, some heat energy so that it starts working. So we're going to have a hot place at a hot temperature um, that puts into the engine some heat. So remember, heat is Q and we're going to call it Q in, the input heat. So this is at a high temperature, high temperature, and we're going to call it T, H, for hot or for high, right? Um, so this would be a, a perfect machine. You put some heat in and it does work. But the truth is no machine works perfectly and some heat won't be able to be converted into work and will be lost to the environment. It'll heat the machine, it'll be lost due to friction, um, turbulence is inside of the machine. So some heat won't be usable and that's what we call the output heat. So it goes out of the machine, it's heat that comes out but it's not useful. We don't want this. This is basically losses that the machine has because it wasn't converted into work. So this goes into a place with cold temperature, a low temperature that we are going to call Tc for cold or, or uh, low temperature. So because of the conservation of energy, the law of conservation of energy that we saw last class, um, what we have here is that all of the energy that we put into it, so the Q in, is going to be divided into two. Some of it will become useful work, and the rest will be heat that goes out. So basically, uh, this equation holds because all of the energy will either go towards producing useful work, 
or towards producing not useful heat energy that goes out of the engine. So this is like today's equation, right? So how does this look um, in terms of what we learned last class of um, thermodynamic processes? So last class we learned about these PV graphs, right? That show the pressure and the volume of the gas when it's inside um, and it does work or receives some heat and changes its internal energy. So an example of an engine is anything that looks like a thermodynamic cycle. So we're going to have here in our graph a thermodynamic cycle. So a cycle basically means anything that comes back to its original position. Cycle is something that starts somewhere, um, completes a cycle and ends back in the same position so that it can start again. So what we're going to have is a situation made up of various um, um, thermodynamic processes of the ones we learned last class that make up a closed circuit in the PV graph. So an example of that could be if we had an isobaric expansion. So this, let's suppose this is our starting point, point zero, and there's going to be an isobaric expansion that takes it to a point one. So that would be isobaric. Uh, from point one, we could have um, an isovolumetric process that takes us down in pressure at a constant volume. So we get to a point two. And then we could have an isobaric um, compression that takes us to a point three. And finally, an isovolumetric process that takes us back to point zero again. So the cycle would be isobaric, isovolumetric, isobaric, isovolumetric, and it's a complete cycle. And what we have here is that the area now inside of the cycle, inside of the closed circuit is going to be the work done um, in this thermodynamic cycle, in this type of engine. So you can combine any type of process that you want um, as long as it comes back to its original position and that will give you a thermodynamic cycle which is a heat engine. And uh, part two of this explanation is about efficiency. So what do you want in your engine? What do you want from your machine? What you want is to have the best efficiency possible. Efficiency. So this is a very important concept when we're talking about any type of engine. Efficiency. So what is efficiency? Basically efficiency is how much work your machine can do with the energy that you put into it. Uh, suppose you have two machines and to both you give an input energy of 1000 joules but one machine does 800 joules of work and only loses 200 to the environment while the other machine takes those same 1000 but does only 500 joules of work and loses the other 500. Which machine would you prefer? You prefer to use the one that loses less energy and produces more useful work. That is a more efficient machine. So basically efficiency is defined as the work, the useful energy that you can take out of it over the energy that you had to put into it. So it's a fraction that determines how, um, how much work your machine can do with a certain amount of uh, energy that you put into it. This is going to give you a fraction or a decimal. You can also give it as a percentage if you multiply by 100%. This is sometimes the way in which it's expressed, but it works as a fraction or um, as a percentage. We can also express this equation a little bit differently using our first equation. If we want to solve for work because we don't have it, we can do it by passing this Q out to subtract to the other side. So we get Q in minus Q out is equal to W. And we can put that into our equation for efficiency. So we would get the following. Efficiency, which we can call E, is W, which is Q in minus Q out, Q out over Q in. And this can be divided into two fractions, Q in over Q in, which gives us just one, minus Q out over Q in. 
So this is just basic algebra, but it gives us two possible equations for efficiency. So you can either use this one if you're given work and energy input, or you can use this one, uh, maybe just this part if you prefer, if you're given um, the output energy and the input energy. So with either pair of uh, variables, you can calculate the efficiency. And what people have wanted to do for since machines exist is to make the most efficient machine possible because efficiency is basically equal to money. The more efficient your machine is, the less money you have to spend to make it work uh, for the same amount of work. Yeah, so anyone that has a machine wants it to do more work for less energy uh, so that they have to spend less. This guy called Carnot wanted to, to investigate what would be the best possible machine, the most efficient machine that you could make when you chose, when you had a temperature, a hot temperature TH and a cold temperature TC. So maybe this was 100 and this was 50. And he wanted to make the most efficient machine or think about what that would look like. So he um, did some research, some theoretical research, and he arrived to the conclusion that the most efficient machine looks like this in a PV graph. So it starts here and it would first be an isothermal um, expansion to here. So this is point zero, this is isothermal. Then it would have an adiabatic expansion. So this is adiabatic. So from point zero to point one, it's isothermal. From um, point one to point two, it's adiabatic. Then it would have a compression, an isothermal compression, isothermal again, 2.3, and another adiabatic back to point zero. Adiabatic. It is a known fact, a proven fact, that the most efficient machine, the most efficient cycle from any hot temperature to any cold temperature is given by two isothermal processes and two adiabatic processes given the, give, giving this um, cycle known as Carnot's cycle or Carnot's engine. So this is Carnot's engine, right? And the work created by Carnot's engine is of course given by the area inside of this thermodynamic cycle, right? So that's what he discovered. Um, and there is an equation to calculate the efficiency of his machine that is um, a more specific way of writing this equation. So this equation for efficiency is only for Carnot's um, engine. And it looks exactly the same as this one, but instead of using the heat, you use the temperatures. So it just, it looks like this. One minus T cold over T hot. And the Carnot efficiency, because it's the most efficient cycle, gives you the maximum efficiency that a machine can have between two temperatures. So this is not only called the Carnot efficiency, but also the maximum efficiency of a machine. Maximum efficiency. Um, but in reality, Carnot engines don't exist. They haven't been able to be produced, although everyone would like to because it's the most efficient possible. But in reality, real machines that have a certain uh, cold temperature and hot temperature can reach about 60 to 80% of the Carnot efficiency. So their efficiency is 60 or 80% of that maximum theoretical efficiency, which isn't even 100%. This can never be 100%, only if the cold temperature was absolute zero. So only at absolute zero, um, a machine would be perfectly efficient, but absolute zero, as we have seen before, um, hasn't happened yet. So for now, no machine can be not even at Carnot's efficiency, that, that would be the theoretical maximum, but in reality, a machine between those temperatures will reach 60 to 80% of Carnot's efficiency.
um, if uh, an efficiency of 100% was reached, we would have something called a perpetual motion machine. So with 100% efficiency, our machine would be called a perpetual motion machine. Perpetual motion machine. Which would mean that the machine can continue working forever, uh, even if you don't continue putting in some heat energy, because the heat energy that you put at the beginning will be recycled forever in time, and it'll keep the engine moving. So you could put one, um, you could fill in your car one time with gas, and that would be enough for the rest of your life. It would keep converting the gas to, to usable energy for your car forever. And that, of course, never happens. But that hasn't stopped millions of scientists and um, other people to try to make a machine with 100% efficiency, but they're never going to make it. So, yeah, that's it for heat engines and our unit on thermodynamics.